Hey, what's up guys, it's your boy Days, and you're about to watch Thorin rant for about three hours. Right, this is going to be another one of my Thornity discussions for people who are at the $100 or above tier. And I've got Matt here, who was on some of the past episodes. If you don't know, he is a League of Legends fan, and he actually also likes to watch the Asian leagues, so not just a Western pleb. Right, so what is on your mind at the moment? Obviously, right now, of in theory, I mean, LCS just finished all the leagues, aside from LCS, are active. I mean, every... The LCK and LPL are right into the playoffs and kind of in the heart of it. So what have you been watching? What are you into at the moment there? Yeah, so right now I'm trying to catch up on LPL playoffs. It's a lot of games, so I'm a little bit behind. But LCK, I have not like watched any of it. I've followed the storylines, but primarily LEC. But LEC has been pretty bad this, I mean, these, this year, I guess, 2024. So I guess we'll start with uh, LPL. Yeah, so. What did you? Which ones have you watched so far? Uh, I caught most of like the most recent ones, and I watched the, the WE team play in the beginning. So, you, so you basically it's only and like the, the NIP, I guess. I'm guessing yeah. it's only the the only only the upper semifinals you haven't watched. Yeah, whatever that one is. BLG I don't know. versus NIP. Have you watched it? The BLG NIP. I believe I watched that one. Top yeah, esports played was... Jing Dong Jaming today. Did you watch it? Uh, no, I just caught results. I like briefly watched it while I was traveling. But right, how about um, what about NIP? What do you think about them? Yeah, I guess the NIP team because when we introed this from like preseason, we talked about how rookies team with the OMG players would would kind of be kind of good. So sure. like, we thought, and I think that. They did, like the season didn't really pan out very well for them, and they ended up like picking it up at the end. Here, I think that their play has been pretty good. I think like Aki on the the Vi was pretty good in these games, and I think Rookie has always been like good on like all his picks. And like he had like a Yone game earlier, which I thought was super good. That might have been the WE one, but yeah, I think Rookie has played super well. I think watching him is always fun. Sure. Yeah, I would yeah. say um, for me, I actually think it's actually been kind of a sleeper season for Rookie, actually, this split so far. He's actually been, I thought he was far and away the best player in an IP. He was actually a pretty good mid laner in the LPL. I would say he'd be in the top three to four. I think he's definitely up there. And if you look at his team, he's pretty much the only one who consistently plays well. In the playoffs, actually, I think he's even, got a, he's even been better. He's been pretty good. Even when they played against BLG, mate, he did pretty well in some of the matchups. So I actually think the interesting thing about this team is everyone said they were frauds a few weeks in. And then even going towards the end of the season, people were still like, ah, they're just frauds. But I think a lot of that is just bitterness from past rookie teams where if someone doesn't, sort of live up to the high standards you want of a rookie teammate. People just think, oh, it's done. And they get like a doomer and they're just ready for the split to end. He's not going to make the finals. He's not going to make it to Worlds. But I actually think if you look at this team, it is better than people say it is, mate. Like if you look at the individuals, I would say their biggest problem for me is just that like people sort of take turns to have a good game. They don't tend to all play well at the same time like a BLG does or a top esports. So for me, like I think Aki's been decent, good. Shanji has his moments. Uh, Fortic actually I thought he carried like the game they won against BLG I thought he actually he has his moments he's certainly good he's, I can see the potential and why he was on V5 years ago I actually think this team's pretty solid the only problem they have is they just aren't as good as the other three teams that are in the playoffs so I'll be very very interested by this lower bracket game against JDG like that's one where if, if they can win I feel like Rookie has to go like supernova but I also think as well if you think about it the champion pool meta is hitting him in the face right now, mate. Remember, this is the guy who plays Oriana, Ari, all this stuff. Like, it's all there right for him. And he's even mixed in a few of those, like, newer champions too. So, yeah, I, as just someone who's a big, big fan of Rookie's game, I still love that. One thing I'll just mention as well, if people don't know, if, if you don't watch the LPL, probably the coolest thing about following Rookie's career is you don't even have to make all those disclaimers that they make for Faker. Like, oh, he's just playing with his mind now. You know, it's chess, not checking. No, no, Rookie's still just 
scores as an actual mid laner and just is really good as a mid laner. Like he's just a stud player, still a star of the league for me. So I, in a way, I don't know about you. I don't know what your background is in sports, but I've had these cycles before when I've been following a player. Like I was a big fan of Kobe Bryant, for example. In fact, quite frankly, any of the players I like, they're all going to have periods when the GM doesn't do such a good job or later in their career. What you have to get, what do you have to, what you have to do basically now is it's so unlikely you're actually going to go to the finals and you're going to win. So you've got to set that expectation out of your mind. What you've got to think of instead is because he's now going to be in a bunch of series where his team's the underdog. It's more like, can you create some legendary moments? Can you have like a really cool, close game where you show like, you know, something sick? Because like I say, if you're someone who's been in the game 10 years and then you can still carry like a series, even if you lose against someone like a top three LPL team, that's pretty cool, dude. That's like, if that was like a basketball player when they're too old to win the championship but they can make like the conference finals or something, that's still pretty cool. That's something to cheer for, you know? Yeah. I felt, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I have the, the greatest game knowledge, but I still feel like Rookie is like a top tier player, right? He's not like, he's mega old, like Wash, but yeah. so I'd still think like if they, if I keep, if he put, if he's put on a really good team, it should still be like top like favorites, right? I mean, put it this way, if he was in like Yagao's position in yeah. like Jingdong, they'd, they'd be ch- challenging for the title. I mean, they already potentially will be, but I think they'd be even better, you know? Yeah. And I don't blame him at all for losing the BLG because the joke is there. That's one of the few mid laners I think should be better than him. Like, like I actually think, Knight, when people have this whole conversation at the moment, especially because you haven't seen him, but in the playoffs of the LCK, Trophy also mega hard carried all those games too. So right now, because everyone really just watches LCK and lies about watching the LPL, uh, the opinion of all the experts now is that like Trophy's the best player in the world. It's not even close. But it's like, are you even watching Knight, mate? Like, to me, Knight's just as good. They're like, they're like 1A, 1B to me. Yeah, I think I, what I also like about the NIP team is like Shanji's rumble. I know on OMG it was super like powerful. And he did lots of crazy stuff. I know like it's normally banned against him if I remember all the drafts. But and when he gets it, I think NIP wins like a really it's high nice in the pool, the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And also, like during I think it was the dope, whatever one of the games on A Soul that rookie had to win yeah in the we series he did some crazy stuff in that one to help save the game because he was like the only carry with the fasting senna sure yeah so he had some even with the newer chance with the weird ace hole picks that are going on he's still doing really good what about uh well pick another team or a player or something pick pick someone yeah okay let's go with the uh... Like Elk, how, how do you feel about Elk and Billy Billy? Is he doing a good job? I think the ADC pool has been kind of weird because it transferred back to crit ADC, so Zary and Jinx are back in the meta. I know Elk has been played around as like the hyper carry in the last MSI, I guess. If he's still holding up as that like carry potential, because I know like BLG is just a team full of stunners with the rest of the team, you know, so. I mean, I actually think he had what maybe his best split ever. I mean, I will say, I do think that'll help if you have like a jungle bid that's like arguably the best in the league and can always be ahead and always be strong. And it's a brilliant priority, etc. That's good, definitely going to help. Like, it's going to relieve some of the pressure on you because surely people have to try and gank them, have to contest them, you know. I also think like actually bid, if people don't know, I thought he was a little bit dodgy towards the beginning of the split. He maybe had some good games later on. Now he's pretty good. So I do think the key thing for me is... I'm not so I'm not sure, like for example, like here's the here's the hard one for me. If I tried to do player to player analysis, like I actually low key think that actually Viper might be the best ADC in the world, even though Hanwell Life will never give him a chance to win worlds or whatever. But if is Elk is good, because in the LPL he might be the best ADC, but also I do think he has far and away the best team. And the difference is the reason why I'm contrasting this split to past ones is when he used to have Yagao. That's not someone who's going to be a super hard carry out of mid. So I did think, actually, if you went back to that MSI and that spring split, I, th- I thought he had Elk had to do a lot. And it, to me, it was almost like old school ADC where you're just praying that everyone peels for you, you get the damage off, and you don't get hit by the CC. He used to have to go absolutely ham. And I used to feel to me like the other team were all just trying to kill him and go really crazy on him. Whereas if people remember at the same time when Ruler and Knight were on JDG together, the difference was you could go like that, like super balls deep to try and get Ruler, but then Knight's going to have some angle where he's just going to come in and like Syndra ball you all, and then you're all going to be fucked, you know, so, or do an Oriana ult or something. So I always felt like Ruler almost had like 
almost like a bodyguard in a way. He had someone almost, he had like essentially a superstar middle in his order off sometimes. Yeah. So I didn't think Elk had that last year in Yagao, but now that he has all no, these has stud not, players, yeah, yeah now, he, now essentially it feels like he doesn't have any weaknesses in his game. So yeah, I think I think that's it. By the way, low key, it's why it's so funny that that whole off-season thing threw people off of the idea there could be a super team in the LPL because mate, BLG, you don't have to even delete the memory of last year's JDG. They're just a straight up super team, mate. Like everyone's really good. Even On's been like, he's fixed so many of his issues. He just doesn't, doesn't hint in the same way. Like this, this team is a massive stud. Like I think there's a very real chance this team could win Worlds. As doomed as that might sound, because I've said it a million times before. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think of him? Well, I, I've just been watching the ADCs in the, the LPL playoffs. And I mean, Elk only got to play this one series. They started so high. So sure. I, I think he's played really good. Like I think that one of his Ezreal games from last Worlds, I think was a super pop-up, if I remember correctly. I, I, know, I always think a pretty good team, but like, he's playing up against like Ruler and Jackie Love this season. And then Ruler's the other like top GOAT contender for ADC, right? So Sure. Jackie Love's also insane right now, by the way. He's yeah. also like if you didn't see the series today, but he's fucking mega, mate. He was really good. I'm also a massive fan of his game. If people don't know, back in the day, I used to actually think, by the way, I think justified. I thought he was like semi-fraudulent when he was on IG because the point is, that was the, t- the team just ran through the solo lanes. So like, yeah, of course he could sort of fuck around in the bot lane. It didn't even matter if he died sometimes. When he went yeah. to these teams where it was just him and Knight and then just him and Rookie, it's like, mate, he's, he is fucking really good. Like you look at the teams on now, and he's just the best player to me. I think he's insane. Yeah. But Jackie Love, like, his narrative was like super throwy, but that's like season nine. It's like a four or five years, years ago, ago now. now. Yeah, so. two years ago now. Yeah. Maybe even like, you know, the early time in top esports, but no, people don't know. He's had that out of his system like two or three years now. It's just his problem is he doesn't go to Worlds anymore. So it just means all these idiots just think like, oh, he went at that one time and fucking... <sighs> they had that bullshit one last in 2022 where they just got grouped because of that nonsense where like they just lost all the opening round games or whatever the fuck that was. That was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, the tournament where like they didn't make it out of a group. Yeah, it's because Rogue was in their group of yeah. DRX, yeah. if you remember. Yeah, so yeah, unfortunately, that one. Yeah. like that's one of those ones where it'll just make an idiot go, oh, see, I knew he was overrated. It's like, you can't really judge him off like six games in the same way, mate. Yeah. Do you actually think um, BLG will uh, win MSI? Because it's looking very likely they go in, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's, so if they're likely to win, like they're very likely to win the season in the LPL. So I guess it depends how good you think Gen G is. Sure. And I, in general, Gen G has had that problem of like changing their meta when they go international. So if they have that issue again, then yeah, I would put Billy Billy as favorites for MSI. Because the thing I think is interesting is I actually do still think what I've thought ever since the LPL began winning Worlds, which is I do actually think by default that if you have two equally good teams, and I do feel like BLG and Gen.G are equally good. If you have two equally good teams, I actually think the LPL team is slightly favoured just because of that like willingness to fight more, to take crazy fights, to just go all out on ganks and stuff. Like One of the things I love about the LPL when they have super stud players is they just commit. It's actually one of the reasons why that series that JDG had against um, T1 at Worlds was so underwhelming because there were moments where they just look hesitant, you know, like it looked like the moment got yeah. to them. Whereas I feel like the thing with the Koreans is they still do on some level want to play out certain like set players and patterns, you know, so you, they yeah. can be a little bit more predictable. Listen, listen, if you have players like they do and people like Chovy, just absolute studs and totally insane and Canyon gags, yeah, you can still, obviously you can still win Worlds too, but I, I, I've actually... It's one thing Dom's tried to explain to people so many times over the years, but they'll never get it, sadly. It's the L- it's the old meme of the LPL. Like, they're just fighting. It's like, no, that's not even... If that was ever true, it's definitely not true now. Like, they don't just fight. They sort of understand, like, if you can take a bunch of small skirmishes, then you can basically, like, get certain ults or summoners out. And then all of a yeah. sudden, the objective or the really big fight that wins the game you just win when the other team doesn't have the big ult on that key play, you know? And so I've always thought that that style, it's it seems counterintuitive, but I've just seen it work too many times now, mate. It just looks really good to me. Yeah. The the Chinese team's like 
how they play like the all the I don't know the extra fighting like is to put more control over the variance of those alts and and summoners. So like you can find your next fight better if you take a fight to take that summoner. And I, I think Dom has done a good job explaining that. I picked that up from his stream too. So it's still the weirdest thing about League of Legends to me. It's why in a way. You, can, you never could, unfortunately, like Counter-Strike, have timeouts in a League of Legends game because then the coach would just say these things and it would essentially sort of ruin the game because it'd be too obvious, if you know what I mean. Like, I mean, it'd be the equivalent of, like, the Microsoft clip, paper clip popping up, like, I think you should bait out this Oriana up. You know what I mean? Like, you, have, you need the players to know that themselves, but it is shocking how many teams in, like, other regions just don't even seem to do that. They just seem to fight, you know? And, like, they seem to act like the 5v5 comp that starts the game is exactly what they have to fight again in the last team fight. But it's like, you don't know. Like, it, mm -hmm. if you really do, like, go into a fight knowing, like, this isn't just a fight to the death, that like, we're trying to specifically see if we can beat this guy out or get, get or even kill a specific player before the fight. You can get so much accomplished in the game, I feel like. It's actually such a smart way to play. There's even times, especially with the LPL teams, where I'll watch a fight and I'll just watch too much LEC or LCS, and I'll be like, oh my God, why are they taking this fight? And then I realize, like, oh, wait, what am I talking about? Like, they got, like, you know, they isolated this guy, got a kill, got another person summoner, then they disengaged, and then, you know, the dragon was free or something. I'm like, fuck, actually, I was the one wrong on that one. They weren't going to take a full 5v5, you know? Yeah. Who else then? You want to talk about someone else? Or someone else oh, on just, BLG? It's up to you. I was going to go one off. So, and more general, because I don't really know that much about the top in JDD. Like, I didn't really watch much of their games previously. So, I mean, B Billy Billy and Ninjas, it's probably the teams I know the best. I guess we could talk about, like, the fall of Fun Plus. Like, they didn't really oh, deserve sure. up in the the fifth round, but they only get one, one series in playoffs, which is kind of a bummer. Because they have all, like, the not-so-good players. And I think this was, yeah, this was a, a series where it was, like, three games of the Lee Sin for for Milky Way. And that's not like the carriest of champs. Like I was wanted to see like another kindred game in playoffs and maybe that's just not in meta, I guess, maybe in fourteen six, but but yeah, I, I was kinda of disappointed because I caught the last three games, it was just him on Lee Sin. The thing is, though, I actually do think in this series, Ben Amant's first ever playoff series, mate, he was good. Like there's one game they lost where he does like a fucking godlike Lee Sin kick in mid. And bro, his his carries just don't click to attack. It's mental. Like, I, I was so frustrated when I saw this move. Like, he actually did for real what should have been like almost like a game winning, like team wipe or like you put you in massively. Yeah. And they just, his carries just didn't do it. And it's like you say, that's the downside, unfortunately, of him being on the Lee Sin, in my opinion, is like, Milky Way, in my opinion, should almost sometimes be cynical and just be like, I'm the carry. You yeah, essentially exactly. play for me. Yeah. Because that's what he was definitely doing against the shitter teams and a lot of times mm -hmm. in the split. And then again, by the way, if I had to go back in, I would guess there would probably be a lot of leasing bands also against him, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, no, the problem in this series was he was good, but yeah, it's like you say, his it's his supporting cast that fell apart. It's actually one thing I get really annoyed about in league and in sports in general. Do you follow any sports, by the way? Uh, I guess I know the NFL the best. All right, the NFL is a good example. It's like if someone um, has one superstar outfield player, could be like a wide receiver, could be like a sick running back, right? It automatically will make other people on their team look better because they're just such a primary option. You just sort of get like free looks. Like obviously the best example would be if you have like the best wide receiver in the NFL, all of a sudden, like your second and third best wide receiver are just getting free looks, you know, they're just getting like a, in the middle of the field or like a short route or something. But the point is they wouldn't be open like that. If you didn't have that superstar, the wide receiver one position, yep. you know, like the second who would just shot you down generally and play like safety over the top or something. So I would say in this scenario, the problem is because initially the premise was wow FPX sucks but this Milky Way guy is God then it developed into like oh no wait a minute like life's not bad like you know especially if he gets that rumble it's pretty cool which is true and then it was like oh you know what and even this care guy he can sort of play hey he's not bad actually maybe he's pretty good but here's the problem people didn't realise it's like that's only in connection to Milky Way though like life only looked like that in my opinion 
I think some of the shit he does with Milky Way would just be what he used to int if Milky Way wasn't there, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. especially it looks like Milky Way just calls and tells him what to do and tells him when to come and group and do a little mission. And then the care guy, if you just look, a lot of the picks were to play for jungle as well, mate. So people were going like, hey, he's better than I expected. It's like, yeah, I know what you mean, but like, this is the league where, remember, this season you had to play fucking rookie. Like, we're not just, you can't just be all right. Like, you have to be really good. You're playing some studs. So and that's the biggest problem for me is I think what you saw in the playoffs was Milky Way is the truth. But some of these other players just aren't that good, mate. It's why I think people got too hyped by the fact that they came fourth, thinking like, oh, does that mean they're actually a real world contender? It's like they never were for one second, mate. So to me, I actually still low-key just really hope he gets out of that team. <laughs> or, or they sign more players, you know? Because to me, especially... <laughs> The top player is okay. He had a bad series here, by the way. But I still think Doc Dam is a fucking scrub, mate. I thought that guy wasn't good in fucking damn one. Like, I think he's just a scrub, mate. He's just not good, in my opinion. So, where's the carry coming from? That's the problem. Like, yeah, that, exactly. If you put him on fucking leasing, what's he going to do? There's no one to yeah. carry when he gets the kick, is there? It's kind of crazy that the Doc Dam life pairing even, like, got put up to fourth in the season like it's wild those, it? those guys were not good at all in korea so it's why in my opinion you don't have to have him as your mvp but i was shocked when the voting came out and milky way wasn't even top three mate in that wild yeah it's it's crazy because like there's no reason fun plus would be anywhere where they are without milky way yeah, they'd probably be like ninth if i had to yeah. guess you know what i mean maybe even lower like cause there's 16 teams right what did you think about his split overall I mean, I watched some of Monty's review, but I didn't watch all the the games. Okay. I saw the one Kindred, like, Baron Steel, where he did all the correct moves with the play. And it's, then Shao, like, hit the map awareness and, like, what he does. Showed, like, he's, like, thinking and directing the team from that. But, like, I can't, like, tell much about, like, his mechanics and, like, what he does. Like, I, I just don't know that much about the game. Funny but thing I is, I, I, yeah, itself, it's like good. I, it, it's, it, it, yeah. I mean, I would just say, I don't even personally think he's like necessarily like, you know, it's not like that we've ever seen a jungler with mechanics like this. There's some extremely good mechanical junglers in the game. The crucial thing to me, two things is the things you said there is one, Dude, you know those clips they used to do at Worlds, and obviously Jack used to do them as well, where what you do is you show a team fight, but then you slow it down on the replay, and then you actually show on screen like each of the abilities the person is using on each person, right? If you did that on a Milky Way like skirmish or team fight, bro, you would actually think this is like the best jungler ever, not a rookie. Like he is actually doing players where, like you say, he does everything correct in the play, and it's too fast for you as the observer to even see unless you watch the replay, and then you're like, holy shit, he did that as well. And so, oh, it's mental, mate. Like, and then the, crucially to me, even though he's a stud, it's, I've never seen a player with like decision making and shot calling as a rookie like this. Like his understanding also of like, we're already where there is an angle, but like when there no longer is, like he's amazing also like disengaging and getting out. Like he's not, he's not just the psycho who just goes all the way in and you have to pray that everyone follows. Like he's not a bore basically. Like Bo had the mechanics and sort of the vision to go for players, but you could tell actually Bo struggles with macro concepts and sometimes doesn't know when to come out or when his team is not going in. Like the Milky Way guy just looks like for real. And there's another reason I think he carried his teammates because if you have a player like that put it this way I'll tell you a story I heard years and years and years ago which is when Fnatic used to have Yellow Star back when it was the Xpec and Soaz lineup a guy who actually got to have like a split as like a referee on stage so you got to hear the comms of the teams said if you ever heard when Yellow Star played in their team he essentially just commed like almost the perfect call all the time. But it's just that in that team, because they had expecting Soaz, who were like even more veteran than him and big names. They just sometimes, you know, would make a play and not listen to him. And so as a result later, when he then made that like rookie lineup and they did the 18 and zero, in a way, it, look, it was a surprise to me that those players were good, but it wasn't a surprise to me that like they sort of like mastered the European macro because that guy apparently just was like the fucking god shot caller, mate. He just sort of could read the game the whole time and communicate also effectively. So I get these vibes from this guy. Like that's another reason I want him to have better teammates because I think if you just put like, like give him a stud mid laner or him one of the best ADCs, fucking hell, I think they win a lot of games, mate. I don't even think you need that much more. Yeah. Definitely someone to watch next split and stuff. So, and then where he moves or goes afterwards. Sure. I guess briefly before switching leagues, I guess I want to talk. So I watched not a whole lot of the split, so I didn't really know how good 
Billy Billy and Top Esports and JDG were in relative comparison, but watching like the seventh through fourth place teams, it's just like they all look super clean. But then people just get three would at the top. So like how good are the top two teams? Like Top Esports and Billy Billy compared to the rest of the league. I mean, I also do still think that like JDG can be in the mix. I just think like yeah. for whatever reason. Maybe matchup wise, it just didn't work as well against top. Like I'd, I'd certainly like to see JDG against BLG potentially. Yeah. Uh, I would just say it's like if you look at the absolute top, mate. Even the rosters just bang on paper. Like 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 those three rosters are just really good yeah. on paper. Like yeah. what a great job all those GMs did, by the way. Like fantastic GMing. And then even more interestingly, this is the classic thing about the LPL. I think right, which is if you look at those teams in top esports, you have. Almost every player, by the way, there's really good. But you've also got 369, who was very, very good. Cream actually had a pretty good playoff. Jackie Love's a stud in general. They can play through most lanes. JDG's a little bit more like Kanavi's their main guy. You get into a fight, rulers there. Stylistically, I think they're very interesting teams. Like to me, that's why I, I'm not even surprised necessarily it's such so mismatch between the two. They've got strengths in different places. The problem is, I still think none of them can beat Billy Billy. Like Billy Billy, mate. Unironically, I'm not the biggest Arden fan, and like I said, I'm not certain on Elk, but he has to at least be top two or three. He's really yeah. really good. They unironically might have like the best player at their position in three positions, and then a fourth, you know, because. As much as like Kanavi probably is the MVP if people want to give it to him, Jun is extremely good too. He's extremely good yeah. also. So I just think that team is so cracked, mate. And they also seem to know how to play as well. Like whatever style they figured out, they've they've nailed it, mate. They've nailed it. Yeah. Do you know how well Kanavi played on these games that happened today? Or was his team just failing? I mean, it's a bit of both. Like the problem you have if you're the top esports guys is like, first of all, I actually thought that, like, for example, there was a game where, um, oh, no, sorry, it was all three games. Ruler chose to play Zeri, yeah. which, is, which already was yeah. surprising to me because even though that is a really good champion right now, it's like, I feel like if you're Ruler, though, I feel like in this scenario, you, you almost feel desperate if you're going for that. Like, I, that was that was the one thing I was a bit surprised for in that sense. And then also, Flandre just didn't do very well. He, if you, he was kind of like smurfing in the regular split, but he wasn't very good today. So that was yeah. a letdown. I do think 36 that is better, so that makes sense. And then, no, Kanavi's still good. Kanavi's good. Like, listen, I have to say, I don't know why the fuck you're picking Wukong. Yeah. I'm not a fan yeah, of that person. You know what yeah. I mean? That's yeah. one of those it, ones where it looks like maybe Scrim meta made you think something's yeah. better than it is. The Annie Wukong thing was like also something they pulled off like last year, if I remember correctly. That was more meta. Yeah, but that was only a night a while ago. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Also, though, I guess we can transition this into like LEC. But like, so what do you think of like the Rek'Sai top? And is that a good for the game? I I saw like Wayward playing it. He looked really good in the LPL playoffs. And like that, there's more playmaking on this champ. But like, it's laning is like kind of ridiculous. But like in general, like it's kind of cool to see that champion do stuff in top lane. I mean, it's interesting because obviously you just associate with Jungle for so many years. But the one issue I have is the person who looked the best on it was Broken Blade. But then again, I actually think this is my hot take. I think Broken Blade, most of the time he's been in the league, he's always top three. But for me, he's rarely the best. And I do think on that particular team, he doesn't have to be the best mate. He doesn't even have to be the best laner in sometimes, in my opinion. So if there's anyone could get away with it, surely it's him, if you know what I mean. I do think it it is something where if you're obviously babysitting a little bit, even just escaping, getting ganked, it's obviously OP if you can get to a certain point, right? You can, it's just really, really hard to get him. So it's one of those ones where it's actually one thing I, I do appreciate about League of Legends, which is in the modern day, I feel like too many coaches always wanted to win draft and then win the lane, you know? Whereas one thing I always appreciated was when you did have a champion where it's like, if you can get it through to this point, then it's really good, you know? Because then that becomes almost like a little fun little mini game for you as the viewer. It's why I always used to love that Monty would give you those win conditions. Like he'd tell you something like that, like, right, this is going to have to scale to this point. But if they get there, then, you know, they'll have a moment when they become the best. Like, I think it's in that sort of a vein. So I, I, for like champion diversity, it's cool. I don't know if it's necessarily that strong. I could see a lot of ways it could be shut down. Yeah, I, I just watched an LPL playoff. It seems like it, it's picked a ton and it does a good job for what it does because it provides like 
really superior flanking with just tunneling over walls, and then his laning is like super overpowered, from what I'm told. So I, I like seeing it like just engage because you get like the triple knock up now or like sure. multi, multi knock up, and then you can also have the the change in the alt to like you can like, you can kill like a, a low health target or whatever well, like a weak no someone who's not building armor a carry even though you're building tank and it just does it just does everything so it's pretty cool to like see the best players play it. I mean, I will say two things on that one. That is one thing that Riot did to the game where, like, it's like participation award culture, mate. No role's allowed to ever be weak, apparently, even though, by the way, like, for example, support and jungle don't even need to do damage necessarily. They have OP other qualities, like you can roam to a lane, you can provide vision, you can fucking gank someone, you can create numbers. Of fact. Like, there's, a, there's, there's inherent advantages in these roles if you play them out, but Riot yeah. wanted every role to do damage. And so classically, yes, just like the old top tank Echo, you don't even fucking build damage, you still do damage and you're a tank, which is like, what? So yeah. the, the reason why, though, I don't think it's OP in the West is because to this day, one thing that just seems like it will never change between the West and the East is the East has the best top laners at flanks. Flanks and TPs, they just seem like they're, they're always a level above. I don't know yeah. what it is they understand or how they're coached that's different, but mate, the amount of Western teams where they don't even attempt flanks, so it's just, they're just poorly done, you know, like they walk over a ward or they take some obvious path, you know. The LPL has those ones where it's like mad thrilling when you're watching the game because you, you, it's almost like a horror movie. You can see them sort of moving in, like, oh my God, are they going to catch them? And then you know the other team's unaware and can't see them in the fog of war. I think that is pretty sick. So obviously that, that fits it. Yeah. So I guess I don't have a whole lot of teams I want to discuss on LEC, more about like, some peripheral like schedule it or whatever the yeah. format and well, some other stuff but what do you what don't you like or what do you like so i've heard that like the people don't like like the, the single round robin into like the two teams lots of coaches or, hate that and some yeah. players complain yeah yeah so i so i would i was think so i think like if you could just put more tournament structure into this so what if like you if you had like a round robin to do seeding to some extent and then you just played like full double LM brackets for like the, the three tournaments. I mean, extent, the weird thing about seated. that is that's essentially like sort of a TI type format. What I don't get is this mate. Why is that a problem? Because remember, the re reason on in theory you need some form of like a round robin is so that you guarantee someone. So in this case, you get a minimum of nine games. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the minimum you get. And then obviously, if you're not in the bottom two, you get a whole bunch more. You get at least like four or six more. What I don't get is, like you say, if you want to guarantee them, just have them play like a best of three against every team in the league and then rank them and then that'll be the seeding and then just start playoffs with everyone in the playoffs. I think what Riot does is this. It's actually one of the things that's so fucking boring about Riot games. Once they establish a concept or they take a concept from sports, they have no imagination, mate. It's like that thing where it's, there's like a quote people have paraphrased from Tolkien where it's like evil can't create, it can only like twist what good is already created. All they do yeah. is they just take like a concept and make it a hard rule like it's from God or something. So in this case, the reason why they don't do that is because in their brain, it's like, but you've got to have regular season and then playoffs and then some teams don't make playoffs. And so that's like really exciting. And then by making playoffs, that's an accomplishment. It's like you don't have to have that at all. I mean, if you yeah. think about it, right, in a way, in traditional sports, there's only one playoffs. Like, isn't Worlds and MSI playoffs in that sense, you know? So to me, I'd yeah. be totally fine with your saying. Just have all the teams play out that structure. If you want, you could do something like have the bottom ones just start in a lower bracket if they have the worst seed. You could also do that, you know what I mean? You could you could do some angle like that. Whatever it is, though, yeah, just get basically... If it's more games, I'm in favour of it. And if it's also a scenario where... The one thing they're all complaining about, if, they, if they're being honest, mate, they're not really complaining about all the things they complain about. Here's what they complain about. They're all scared that they're going to be ninth or 10th one split. And that when that happens, they're just sat there for three weeks and there's nothing going on. And then they have to like consider, do we cut people, right? And also yeah. players are really scared that you'll get fucking benched after nine games. And by the way, if you sort out the guys of this, but you should be scared of that. Like that can happen, whether it's justified or not. So I get that. So essentially your idea, I think, pretty much solves that instantly, doesn't it? It just gives you extra yeah. games. And then also they're not all the same amount of pressure either. Like at the end of the day, you could even have some mad scenario where like G2 could actually win like two games and then still win the playoffs, right? That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In its own way. 
I think the thing like in the damn best damn league show that Zabatine said is like, why why are you bothering eliminating like two teams from the playoffs when you just put them in the lower bracket and or play like two sure. extra backs of threes and just have a full ten team double elimination tournament or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess. So the other point on LEC, I guess, would be that I know like you guys have talked a bunch on something inside about like the terrible GMing and like why there are no really good teams in Europe besides whatever G2 held their players from last year. So it seems like it got worse between this split, the last split and this split. Cause you have like team BDS not looking as good and fanatic being the same fanatic. They always are. It just seems like is, is Europe like regressing that much or is it just really all this like GMing? Like there's enough good teams on Europe to make a good team, like two good teams to can send to MSI. They're just, Poorly GM'd. I mean, I think literally almost every team is badly GM'd except G2, like unironically. Like if I just run through some of them. So um, if you go with Fnatic, it's like the thing that tilts me the most is people now say, I assumed that the Jun guy was just brought because it's like get another Korean, have it be a Korean bot lane so they can speak in Korean sometimes, can just do a QT. Apparently the Noah guy didn't even necessarily know the Jun guy was coming or want him. She's like, what? So that already is a nightmare right there. Like they probably should have just kept Trimby, mate. They should have signed him in the off season. They'd actually probably be better right at this point in time. And then they still have some of the same problems. Humanoid just has games he's all right on sometimes. Oscar Renin's good, but he's still developing. He, he, remember, he's only in his second year. He hasn't even played all the splits. So Fnatic could definitely be GM'd better. Vitality, it's like, I just don't know why the Douglas guy's in that team, mate. It's like the rest of your team, now that Hillsang doesn't it, is fine. In fact, I actually think Photon and Kazi are really good. I think Vethio's pretty good. Like, there's the makings of a really good team there, but the Douglas guy just seems clueless. I don't know why you've... That's exactly where I want a veteran jungler, you know. I don't want a fucking rookie. Yeah. Then if you go to Heretics, this Viru guy actually in the playoffs had a gloat, mate. He looked a lot better. The problem is this team did so many stupid things in the game. Like, ah, the... the it's just a bad combo of t- like one thing that hasn't worked out is Wonder and Flackhead at this point in their career for whatever reason they're just weak side type players, but you got two of them on one team, and then the guy that you're then making the carry is like Zviru, and he's your fucking complete rookie. Like how are you supposed to win like that? Even if you have Trimby, SK. The problem is like the Dos guy I've always thought is pretty bad. Exekick is good, but he's like a glass cannon type ADC for me. Niski at the moment just ints. He actually just had some really shocking series for me. I, he, I expect more from them. He's a veteran. Yeah, that's it. that's about it for them. Mad Lions, the only problem is, like, I never thought Alvaro was good because I didn't watch the other shit. So he is really good. But, like, mate, imagine if you had just had El Yoyer on Vitality. You know what I mean? Yeah. Isn't that instantly contender for the title? Like, to me, it's almost a waste of his fucking time being on that team. Because you saw this split, they actually finished exactly where I, th- I thought they would. I said on Bedtime League, so I think they're fifth or sixth team. Giant X is just a nightmare. Like, it looks to me like, where's the shot calling in that team? Even looks like a bunch of people who probably all flame each other, if I had to guess. BDS, sadly, was the most predictable fall off of all time, mate. Because if you ever watched my shows, yeah, I give credit to Adam when he was really good. I gave credit to Labrov for individual players. That's it. You'll notice I never gave the other ones massive credit individually. I actually always thought this team was just really shrewd coaching. They still look like they're well coached, mate. It's actually why they can sort of beat teams that I think have better rosters than me. Like, pretty square. I actually think for real, here's a hot take for you. I think BDS might have like the fourth or fifth best roster in LEC. I mean, by the way, if you watch some of these playoffs, series, Adam's playing like shit as well. Like, it's just not that good a team, mate. It's just not really that good a team, but it's just well coached, in my opinion. They just know what to do against all the other teams except G2. So if you just go through those rosters, like every one of those teams in general has a good player or two good players. With Well, think about in the past in LEC, that was never the case. You know what I mean? If you go back like two years to the old format, you looked at those top four teams and they were pretty much going to be the all pro players. You know, maybe you'd have the odd one like Avethio come along or Razor appear when they were misfits, but... Generally, those top teams were just stacked with players. I mean, if you remember back in the day, people just wanted to always go to G2 and Fnatic. But I also yeah. think if you look at it, there's been some really stupid rookie gambles for my money. And then people have also just like signed veterans, but they've expected things out of them that they're just not going to do. 
Like, I, I myself got tricked by the Wonder One, mate. I thought, what's going to happen is, well, now there's nobody. He has to weak side four. He will just be a stud top laner. And I even thought, mate... I, I fancy him to fucking take over people like Broken Blade. He, he's not really that player at this point, unfortunately. He doesn't even seem like he thinks that way anymore. I don't know if it's a conditioning thing or what, but that guy just isn't there anymore. He can still be good, but he's, he's not like that elite, you know, like world-class top laner that, with, you know, that had the fucking swagger and the arrogance. So I just think it's very poorly GM'd, very poorly. What do you think? I, I know, you make the good arguments, like, there are good players on all the teams. It's just like there are certain parts in each team that are just like really not well put together for the team or could be greatly improved. And then G2 is the same team essentially from before. So I guess like the question I had a question I have is like, is the jungle pool looks kind of weak in LEC or are we just missing junglers? I don't know of any like junglers that are not in the LEC really. And we have like a couple that are just like so we said like Douglas and Shio aren't really the greatest junglers. No, no. And, and Peach is in here. Peach is trash. Yeah. And then Isma's, Isma's all right. Repeat. He's yeah. alright. You know, he's I don't think he's mega, but he's all right. He, he has some games that are all right. El Yoyo's good, but like I say, he's trapped on a bad team. And then he he, he fucking locked himself in that cell, by the way. Yankos is like Still generally good. He had a couple of playoff games that were a bit sauce. He's still generally good, but if you look away, like, look at his solo lane. So solo lane is a wonder in Zviru, and then he has fucking flack at ADC. Like, what, what do you want, you know? Like, like, remember, he's not the super carry jungler, so yeah. you, you're on the wrong team. By the way, another one, Magic Yankos on Vitality. Mate, that'd be fucking game over. I'm pretty, I think Vitality could, there's a hot take. Vitality could actually win the league with some of these junglers, mate. If they had Yankos, yeah. El Yoya, I think they could win the league. Obviously, Raz Orc, but I'm not, I, I, you, there's no reason he'd leave Fnatic in that sense. Like these players, I think Vitality would be really strong at that point in time. Like they're actually one of the ones where I do respect the way they've built their team. They just gambled on the wrong rookie. Like I think Photon is mega mate. Um, for real. Um, I actually think if he has another season where he doesn't like make a final, doesn't win, I think he should just go to LCK. Surely, if they watch, they'll see how good he is. Like I think he could be in a good LCK team, mate. He could be on like one of those top five teams. Yeah, I don't know. Monty explained like LCK is pretty like whatever East West. It's like really highly valued teams that you'd want to go on the top five, and they're like really competitive against spots. But like you don't really want to go to LCK if you're on the bottom five teams. What about who else? Yeah, uh, I think I'm I'm good with the LEC. So I guess. Next question is just briefly on Team Liquid's win and like what that means for LCS. I know LCS has been like a dying region. I don't really watch it anymore, but like it seems weird that. Did you watch the finals? They got. I I watched like the first a couple games and then you guys said like FlyQuest played weird because their, their drafting coach was like fired or whatever. So I didn't Suspended, bother watching yeah. the rest of it. No, here's the thing it was, it was bad. It was bad League yeah. of Legends. The problem we have is this. The FlyQuest that beat Team Liquid and beat Cloud9, mate, their top side looked like it was peaking. They were all looking. It's, it's not. It's not. I'm not even surprised they talked shit. Like they actually all individually are better players in general, and they were all in a position where they looked better. So it's like I get why they were talking shit. But mate, they had no game plan in this final. Even the picks were like so uninspired. They were going to the same picks over and over again. And the worst thing is this: if you remember my take. By the way, it's even worse in LEC now because BDS is still the fucking second best team. You know my take last split when BDS was at their peak and they were the only team aside from G2 at smashing everyone. And I said to everyone, good for BDS, terrible for LEC though. Because as I just mentioned, I don't think their roster's that good. So if a team like that, in their case, it was like they were just really good at setting up fights, getting the fights they want, winning the fights, even from numbers and stuff, even from behind. That's a terrible sign for all the other teams, though, because it's like you're not excelling in all the other parts of the games, but that one part being better than the other teams means you just win. Dude, Team Liquid is that times 100. Like, Team Liquid is just one of the only teams that actually does, like, sensible draft. Doesn't even It's not even all, like, genius drafts. Sensible draft, and with a, with a plan... As a result of the sensible draft of the plan, they're able to give APA the champions that they can play on. People have hyped this motherfucker through the roof, mate. Just wait. It's going to be Parlor Fox against Wait from the Golden National. And then 
You look like, I don't care that he's the champion now. I don't think that young guy's that good, mate. He had a couple of good games in this final, but that's it. I, I think he was also playing against one of the easiest ADCs you could ever play in a final of LCS as well. Like, think about all the times you play a stud in the LCS finals. That fucking Massau guy just did it. He's just all right at best. He's easily the worst player on their team. So yeah. if it's so un uninspired, like, here's the thing. Yeah, you won... Um, LCS and you made it look clean, but I think Team Liquid is going to get actually destroyed at MSI, mate. When they get to the the bracket stage, I, I, it's going to be so. I don't you know. Essentially, the only team I think they can beat is if in the lower bracket they can get like whoever second from Europe is. If it's BDS or if it's for that, maybe it's possible to beat them. But I don't think you can do anything against these Asian teams. I just don't think you have the player strength to do it. Essentially, to me, Team Liquid got everything out of their squad. Like, let's say out of 100%, they hit like 95% for this playoffs. So, mad props to spawn the coach, rain over, even people like how Core JJ and Impact play and set up the rest of the team. But the problem is, in any game, it's like the NFL, you could have an amazing team with loads of schemes, but you also need superstars. They, they won't win you the game, they won't win you the Super Bowl, get you through playoff matches, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it just seems kind of like crazy that, like, the Cloud9 and FlyQuest just, like, couldn't beat Liquid. Like, I guess Liquid was peaking, at, was, as you say, but, like... Well, the I'm just, and there's this mad extenuating circumstances for FlyQuest. The Cloud9 yeah. one's obvious, mate. I made yeah. this point to Monty, and I could see it almost dawning on him. Like, week five. It's like, bro, who's the fucking shot caller of that team? They don't have one, as far as I can tell, mate. Like, Fudge is actually a, just a fucking below average at times top laner now. Blabber, I think, never developed, mate. I think he's, like, pretty... If, if he was in Europe, he'd never win a fucking MVP in his life, mate. Like, he's pretty good. If you think of what Razork was a few seasons ago, like, yeah, he could be, like, really coin flippy, like, go for big players. Like, Blabber never became, like, the genius jungler. He doesn't seem like he has a mega mind for the game to call for stuff. It seems like he just goes for his players. He calls them. He collabs with someone. Giorgio Pion looked mega playing with Inspired. A guy who wants you to play with him, for him, pick for, for him, listen to him. He'll tell you what to do. He's going to control the whole floor of the game. Without him, Giorgio Pion's good, but he's not a guy who's like taking over the whole game. Berserker actually had a very underwhelming split, mate. Like, for real, I would watch, again, maybe he's scared to go back, but I would really watch if he stays in NA after this year, mate. If I'm him, I might be thinking about going back to LCK too, if like, you know, if one of those teams is willing to give me a shot. And then Vulcan's just all right. He's just all right. And then I do think Mithy struggled in this team. I think in the whole time Mithy's been on cloud nine, I almost got this vibe like he's never been like the big ego coach. I think he's been too accommodating to players. So I found cloud nine incredibly underwhelming. Because on paper, by the way, that should win the LCS, that yeah. roster. That is, even though I don't like Fudge, that is a super team. He doesn't have to be part of it. You know, that's a super team. Like, Blabber, Giorgio Piotr already should be like, holy fuck, how are we going to contest that? Yeah. But exactly. the joke is, you go look at the Team Liquid roster, that Team Liquid roster destroyed him, mate. <laughs> Wasn't even that yeah, close. That's crazy, yeah. So, I'm trying to find the, the previous team. So, like, they had shot calling from their coaches, but it was Zven and m &S in here. So, was Zven doing some shot calling, or were they not good? That good last year. I mean, year. I didn't like, think Cloud9 was fire? that good last year. If you remember, yeah, MS was like just really. it was just hands. That's all he had. Yeah. And then look, I will I'd imagine Sven helps in the sense that unlike Berserker, Sven is a hundred percent fluent in English, and he has always been a guy who will he'll call for some stuff. Like he has strong opinions. No, in general, I think the most un if you haven't noticed, I think in NA especially, bro, the most underrated role is the shot caller. And when I say that, people go mad at you. Yeah, yeah, do it as a team. No, no, I mean like one guy, though, who can see the bigger picture in the game and who can sort of like keep you on track. Like it's the reason why if I if I if you tell me these superstar rosters are gonna fail, then yeah, if you tell me APA and Yon are gonna win, I'm pretty surprised. But if you tell me Call JJ can win, oh okay, now now I can understand. You know what I mean? Like that makes yeah. sense. And so I've, it's like, that's why I think the most criminally underused player in the LCS in the latter half of his career was Afro Moomit. 
Because when I went and asked other players, they all told me he still had a great mind for the game. He was still shot calling the fuck out of everything. He could both like call like how the lane 2v2 should be played out, but then also like call went to group and that. But if you look, he just played for progressively worse and worse and worse and worse teams. And it seemed to me like maybe he just didn't want to take a big gamble on certain moves and then it was too late by the end. So when you have these players, mate, there's a reason they dominate the LCS. Even when you go to players that aren't necessarily the shot call, but they're like the player that defines the style. Probably the most famous example ever, Ick Smithy. Mate, I don't think you can really go wrong with Ick Smithy on a team, can you? Yeah, you might hear all the stories. Yeah, oh, but he's, he's coming drunk. <laughs> he's not practicing. I don't give a shit, mate. You see him in those playoffs, he's, he is money in the bank. He just knows it. He's like a great, like a player who just knows how to always play for, even from behind, even when he's not on his meta picks. Like the guy just, the guy just wins. It just wins, but for some reason, people always get the allure in League of Legends of like, yeah, but when I've got, yeah, okay, let's say I've got like a 7.5 player. Yeah, but I want to gamble that this player that I've never seen play at my level, maybe he's nine. It's like, well, how many times does that work out? Like, it works out rarely, in my opinion. Yeah. Want I to think that's topic? A... Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. We can, uh... so I did watch some of the, or I guess most of the playoffs of the CSGO major. I did not catch all, all right, I didn't really watch the grand final, but I watched G2's run and FaZe Clan's run, at least. I think in the sense of like what happened in the final, like, because when you talked in your show, it was like FaZe Clan had to like beat the best teams to get there, and then they lost against Na'Vi. So like what exactly happened there in that game? I mean, a few things. Like, first of all, I, in, I mean, I'll just give you the quick rundown. So in the fir first of all, in the draft, and I do think this is because of what happened in those other matches, because of how incredibly, like, exhilarating it must have been when Faze beat Spirit and to do it with that, like, crazy veto bluff, and then their bluff was even called, and then they still won on the Vertigo Decider. Everyone was saying, I'm even going to do a video on it, like, that is the most genius veto in the history of League of Legends. But also, it's insane that you sort of came through the game. Like, maybe, maybe I think Spirit did choke on the third game. Then you got to play Vitality. Now, look, I'll tell you, Zebu was just not in this. That wasn't Zebu, mate. That's not the guy that asked you win the MVP at tournaments. And then they also just just kind of fell apart on some of the key rounds in Inferno, even though it was a very close game, actually, even though the score looks like it's one set. Nah, it's one of those ones where, like, the rounds are all going down to 2v2s and 3v3s. It's really exciting. I think Carrigan did actually call a great series. The problem is this. One of the things, the two things you had going for you if you were FaZe Clan is Brokey was playing out of his mind. Like, all these series, he's having massive impact. And then Carrigan, even though, look, he was actually fragging better than he'd done in his entire career to that point in time. It's an IGL, this isn't CSGO. And he was even, like, eye test-wise, getting kills that you'd never expect. Like, for real, he was fragging, like, people like Zewu and fucking Donk in, like, duels. Not even, like, he's hitting him in the head straight away. Just, like, they would whiff, and then he would just sh shoot him in the chest and get a kill. You're like, what the fuck? The problem is, in the final... None of those things happened. Like, everyone on FaZe was worse. And the worst thing is, Rops had already had a very quiet tournament because I've heard he's a bit burned out. And he just wasn't present. They still won. By, and then in the draft, that's what I was le leading to, they tried to do another genius 200 IQ move, which is instead of just picking Nuke, which both teams like, and I think FaZe is better on, they decided to pick Ancient, which admittedly Na'Vi had looked a bit sus on, and then they just lost it. And because they lost it, the next map was, um, let me think, what was it, Anubis maybe? Fuck. Mirage on here. Mirage, oh, sorry, Mirage, yes. That was actually like a giga stomp by FaZe. And then the third map, Inferno, should have been like a closer one, but you'd expect FaZe to win. Here's one of the worst things. Carrigan just instantly regressed to the mean. He went one for 15 in this game. Is that like the very end, considered like, a he had, to he, he had one kill, like, mate. In in he had one kill. Yeah, but do you think that's like a pressure choke, or is that just like it just looked shit? It just, yeah. it just. I mean, I just think he's not. Listen, remember, he should he should always be the worst player in the server. Like he's thirty three right, like year one old. Kill is like no, but that's absurd. Bad. Yeah, yeah, well, that's like everyone's yeah. just fragging the shit out of you. You're not doing anything. So some of that's choking, maybe. But yeah. I also think some of it's just like you can't get you can't walk on water forever, you know. And yeah. then the other thing is, and this is so heartbreaking if you face. Right, I have a saying I always used to use on the analysis desk. And even most of my other analysts just like roll their eyes because there's all fucking bozos who think the game's only about tactics. Which is, 
You never let a player who is quiet get extra time. As in, if you're thrashing them, you've got to just kill them dead there. You've got to 2-0 them. You've got to win like 13 to 6. You've got to keep the pressure on. Essentially, if you've got the boot on the neck, you just crush it, right? You crush the windpipe. By allowing the map series to go to three maps because they fucked around with that ancient pick and then Na'Vi won it, in the third map of this one, Bit, who had been quiet the whole tournament. Bro, you have to realise, Na'Vi had played 17 maps. Like, he had almost no big performances. He went completely fucking ham on this last map and just did shit, like, on T-side, just run out with, like, an AK and just, like, shoot three people in the head out of the apartments on, like, Inferno um, a site. Just shit that, like, you know, he would have done, like, 2021 where he was at, like, prime Na'Vi when they were just winning everything. So they just let this guy wake up. They were all fragging fairly sus. And then they let this guy wake up and he took over the game while Carrigan simultaneously chain fed the game. So it's actually one of the most depressing ways I've ever seen a mega favorite lose the game, mate. Like at least when you do lose those ones that are really close, you can just think, oh, if you've done this, this is like, you almost feel like you didn't even play. Like, by the way, also Navi's just leading the whole way through this third map. It's not even that competitive a game. Yeah. So it's just a bummer of an ending. I mean, look, not in the sense that, like, I'm a big fan of Alexi B, obviously. I've always liked Wonderful's game. GL was kind of... Oh, yeah, also the GL guy smurfed in the finals too, by the way. There's a the reason he, he got the MVP for the major. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, give me, you, you give me some thoughts on some of, some of what you saw the major over rap on that. I mean, I don't exactly know enough of, like... No, just as soon as a layman. Like, we're, is, we're, not, we're, not, okay, we're not trying yeah. to do like fucking Monte Cristo analysis here. Okay, okay, people yeah. having a conversation about the game. So what, what did you think? What, what were things that you enjoyed or what, what drew your eye or surprised you or shocked you? What, what did you think? Give me some thoughts. I, in, in general, I kind of like the narrative that G2 is in uh, CSGO, like with the Nico and the, the Bosnian team, like what he does and how he can, if they can push that, that region through or okay. not. So I like to see like how they go and like because I know G two like from League of Legends sure. like just the brand is pretty cool so I, I'd like them to win every once in a while. I think like watching the uh, the team Spirit team, I think I caught more of Donks and Kedavice than this time, but I didn't really watch a bunch of those games. I guess I guess I watched some more of the RM RMRs and I saw some more not the RMRs the the other stages of the game. Yeah, I think like watching through that. But I remember, I think that some of the Brazilian teams like got further than we were expecting. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people had those teams like zero three, including me, and then they didn't. A lot of them went like two two. So yeah, it was pretty tough. Yeah. I. Are you enjoying CS two more? I, I mean, I watch it every once in a while. Like, I don't notice that much difference between CSGO. So, like, it's such a fun game to watch. As sure. like, it's very easy to, like, understand what's going on yeah. in the game. And you can just see, like, oh, someone's winning and they win the round. And then you just watch points go up. So, it's, like, it's in that sense, like, I can associate the players and the teams and I can follow the narratives, like, who does what and hope that person wins because I like their style or whatever. But, but yeah, it's in general, like, I like it for that as well as what it was before. So, I mean, people often draw the analogy for Counter Strike that it's like the NFL because of the tactics and, you know, the, the defense is trying to figure out what you're going to do and then you're trying to read the defense. But that's just on that sphere of the game. And the problem with that is that's actually pretty technical stuff. Like you have to know a lot about like the utility usage and the meta of what people normally do in a certain spot. So, I, I've always said to me, the real reason I think people watch Counter Strike is actually it's more like the NBA. It's like you see, you could just watch people shoot people. That's like watching the people shoot basketball shots, you know. You don't have to know about the defensive scheme in basketball or the way he used to pick and roll. You just watch the guy take a shot. If he makes it, he makes it cool. If it doesn't, he doesn't. It's It's got a very like intuitive feel to it. You can just get into it. You can, that's why, by the way, I have always thought basketball is the ultimate sport spa um, sport because you can just have it on a TV. You can watch any any country's basketball game if you're having a beer in an airport you can just get into it for 10 minutes you know you don't really need to know all the players yeah in this esports world it can seem like everyone's against you but I've always got the Skrilluminati my Patreon community riding with me and it is thanks to the support of the following people this video and all of them on my channel are made possible Matt Pugnaccio Rakula Ahmed Haju Frisky Tosh Jensen Gore Animosity 
Tukan, Tobias Bernasconi. If you've ever watched my videos, you know now I'm going to give a massive shout out to Jerky's Minion, the main man. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? You want teasers? Find out who the upcoming interview guests are. Maybe you want to ask me a question. I tend to answer them at length in my video AMA. Do you want to take part in one of those dinner discussions where we talk about what you're interested in esports? Well, if any of these perks or more appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skulluminati today, where in the description box below is a Patreon link.